Great. So it looks like our, our attendees have started filing in or have finished filing in. So I suppose we can go ahead and just get started right now. Uh, my name is Emmett Mark. I'm from CIC Vancouver. We are incredibly privileged and honored to have Eve Tiebergen, a professor from the University of British Columbia here, to, to do a presentation as well as a Q&A session on the geopolitical impacts of COVID-19, which I'm sure is a topic that's very on the top of mind of many of our audience here today. Uh, firstly, I would like to acknowledge that I myself am calling from near UBC, from the unceded and traditional territories of the Hunkamining speaking Coast Salish people. And we'll begin our event first with, I will first introduce Professor Chibergian, and then we will go through our, and then we, then Professor Chibergian will go through his uh, presentation, which will likely take between 40, 45 minutes. And afterwards, we will have a public Q&A session where members of the audience will be welcome to ask Professor Chibergian um, questions, concerns, comments about his presentation, as I'm sure there will be absolutely plenty to discuss. It is a fantastic presentation. So first, I'll be here to introduce Professor Eve Tiebergen, who is a professor of political science, director emeritus of the Institute of Asian Research, and co-director of the Center for Japanese Research at the University of British Columbia. Eve is also a distinguished fellow at the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada and at the University of Alberta's China Institute. He serves as the International Steering Committee member representing Canada at Pacific Trade and Development Conference. In November 2017, he was made a Chevalier de l'Ordre National du Mérite by the French president. So while lots of international experience, lots of, lots of private sector, lots of public sector experience, very excited to see the presentation that he's going to be bringing in today with all of those sort of backgrounds coming in. So Yves' research specializes in East Asian comparative political economy, international political economy, and global economic and environmental governance with an empirical focus on China, Japan, Korea, Southeast Asia, and Europe. So I think without any further ado, I'll pass it on to Professor Eve Tiebergen to begin his presentation, which, and, uh, and uh, you're always welcome to put Q&A questions in the bottom, uh, which you'll see at the bottom of this webinar. And then during the Q&A session, we'll get to those questions and we'll slowly discuss through them for Professor Tiebergen to answer those. Take it away, Professor. Thank you very much, Emmet. Thank you to the CIC uh, and thank you, Emmet, for having me. Uh, this is a great honor to uh, reflect together on what's happening this year with the, the COVID-19. Um, I also second the land acknowledgement by recognizing that I'm here on Coast Salish uh, unceded ancestral uh, land. So thank you everyone for taking your time tonight. I'm going to now share uh, my presentation. Um, so share screen. All right, so we uh, took this very broad topic, uh, geopolitics of COVID-19. Uh, and I'll start with a few, uh, a few images about what's happening around us. Um, so clearly we're in a time of great disruptions and with an urgency of in innovative thinking. Uh, humanity is under quarantine, and this has been uh, an extraordinary experience and actually a shocking experience for all of us, uh, given that humans are by nature social. Um, another cartoon about this adjustment, historic adjustment. Uh, and in the last few days, uh, there is this extraordinary event uh, with COVID landing in the White House. Um, and as far as we know, it was probably already present uh, during the debate last Tuesday. Uh, so this is really new territory. Uh, also, I'll put a, a note here that in terms of a global uh, systemic risk or challenge, uh, COVID to some extent could be seen as a dress rehearsal for the bigger problem of climate change. Uh, so this cartoon from The Economist shows climate waiting in the wing uh, and where today uh, coordination and management has not been up to the level of the threat. So final moment of humor here about uh, the new civic virtues on the COVID. So the questions uh, that I want to address today are the following. Uh, what is the long-term impact of COVID-19 shock? 
what is different from the business as usual trajectory? In what way did COVID change the trajectory of global affairs? Uh, and then there's a side puzzle, uh, which is that it's actually a pandemic of relatively limited mortality, you know, about 2.5% mortality rate uh, compared to the Spanish flu of 1919, 1918-20, uh, uh, which had about 10% or even the Asian flu of 1957, the Hong Kong flu of 1968, which had higher mortality rates. Uh, and yet, why is the pandemic the greatest economic recession and the most dangerous geopolitical condition is the Great Depression? What, what's happening and what is so special about it? And the key points I'm going to uh, put forward in this presentation uh, are the following. Uh, COVID-19 has generated a multi-level global crisis that involves, you know, it's like concentric circles. It's a health crisis, an economy crisis, a societal crisis, a crisis of the global economic order, and a geopolitical crisis. And all of those different levels are interacting with each other, uh, generating great stress and fissures in the global order. And so it's hitting us in a way uh, you know, it's like a bunch of curve balls eating us at the same time and generating all this tension around the global order. Uh, it's particularly, I would argue, the timing of this crisis and the inability of the major players to coordinate together that have made this such a potent crisis. We know uh, also that the initial lack of transparency and control in Wuhan, China, prior to January 20, helped make this a global pandemic. We also know that it's the U.S. veto on global cooperation in global institutions and U.S.-China tensions that have paralyzed the global response. We also know that we're in an electoral year in the U.S. and the November 3rd elections will have a crucial impact on the rest of the story of how this unfolds going forward. Um, so for the rest of the talk, I thought I would focus on essentially nine myths and realities. What are, nine takeaways that we can uh, really summarize from what's happening at those multiple levels. Uh, and I will preface this by saying that this is extremely difficult uh, to do because this is a very odd year, an odd event, where the narrative keeps changing throughout the year. You know, in January, it looked like it was the Chernobyl moment for Xi Jinping and for China uh, that could make or break the governance of China. Uh, in February, in fact, China lost control of the internet to some extent. And then by March, China was getting out of this crisis uh, and the rest of the world hit it. And in March, the whole world basically stopped the global economy. A one third of the global economy was shut down around the world. Uh, later, it turned into a European crisis and then it turned into an American crisis. And then it, it, brought, it became a broader crisis, in particular in Brazil and India. Uh, and so you keep metastasizing and having different narratives and the narrative has not fully settled yet. So that's the preface for what I'm going to say, but uh, there's a lot of data points that we can look at and some conclusions we can take already. So point number one uh, about the context. There's a bunch of things that COVID-19 is not responsible for. And so it's important to put this on the table first. COVID-19 is not responsible for the historic shift in balance of power that has happened since the mid 90s, uh, during which between the end of the 90s and 2018, 20% of global economic power have shifted hands from the advanced economies of the OECD to the non-West. Half of that shift went to China. The other half went to India, Southeast Asia, Central Asia, a little bit to, uh, uh, to Russia. I mean, Russia stayed stable, but mostly Brazil, et cetera. So there's been this big moment of shift in the balance of power. That is pre-COVID. We also have seen a fraying order. The global institutions uh, built in 1945 are uh, reaching uh, the limits on many issues and need to be reformed, need to be uh, changed or upgraded. Uh, that includes WTO, IMF, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that is all prior to COVID. Also, we have just gone through a big wave of globalization for 30, 40 years without adequate global rules or domestic rules that have generated higher inequality and financial crisis, again, prior to COVID. We have seen peaking trade. Trade as a percentage of GDP uh, at the global level has stopped increasing for a few years. And in fact, the biggest hit to trade was the great financial crisis of 2008, 2009. Uh, 
we are still living in the legacy of the global financial crisis with the more precarious middle class in the US and beyond with millions of people who have lost their homes during the crisis and never fully recovered their living standards uh, in that lower middle class. We also, of course, are facing climate change. And we in BC have just faced the consequences uh, in the first two weeks of September with smoke all over uh, and an increase in forest fires that is predicted, in fact, to get worse year after year. Uh, but this is a global phenomenon. We we are all living through the fourth industrial revolution with AI, robots, the acceleration of the digital age. All this is prior to COVID. We have seen hardening regimes, more authoritarian, more brazen in China and Russia. And again, that started before COVID. We have also seen the arrival of Donald Trump to the US presidency and the subsequent erosion of the liberal international order as President Trump turned against most global institutions. Uh, and stop advancing global democracy. Um, and finally, we have seen an erosion of arms control regimes. We have only one or two left, but all those arms control regimes set up during the Cold War between the US and Russia uh, are all left behind one after the other, in fact, both by Russia and the US. So we have, uh, you know, scientists are, are warning us that we are in more danger in terms of uh, nuclear weapons than ever before. So those are things, this is the context before COVID hit us. Uh, now, uh, point number two, uh, what COVID has revealed is that we at the global level, were quite vulnerable in terms of pandemic governance. We did not have the right global institutions. And we also discover at the domestic level that many countries have gone in all kinds of directions. Some were more ready than others. Some were ready on paper and yet did not deliver. So we have seen a very, very diversified response uh, with some good and some bad. So at the domestic level first, great variation. The key takeaway, countries that focus on non-politicized, science-driven response have done better uh, than those where there has been a heavy dose of partisan politics. Um, the next point is that performance actually cannot be separated between democratic authoritarian countries. We've seen among the top performers, as I will show you, we have both democratic and authoritarian countries. And among the worst performers, we have both authoritarian and democratic countries. So that is not a critical explanatory variable. However, we know that the authoritarian response can have long-term negative costs in other ways. At the global level, what we observe is we were poorly organized in terms of capacity to deal with pandemics, despite a lot of warnings from a lot of epidemiologists over years. Uh, in fact, many books had predicted exactly this kind of pandemic, uh, including one by Osterholm and Altschacker, a famous book uh, published in 2017. Uh, the WHO simply lacks a rapid reaction force. It's a slow organization that works based on consensus of all governments, is cautious, and it depends also on government for access to the ground. Uh, it's also very peer review kind of uh, uh, organization. It waits for all the scientists to review a particular uh, announcement and approve it, which delays everything by weeks. So in this case, we know that WHO failed to call this a global pandemic until way too late in, in the pandemic. Uh, the US withdrawal had hit uh, the capacity at the global level pretty dramatically. And we now also see an intense competition over vaccines. Uh, and this global coalition COVAX doesn't have the US, China, or Russia on board, even though they have some degree of involvement behind the scenes. So now I'm going to show a few uh, data points to illustrate those, uh, those points. Um, so that's the big picture where we are today. Uh, as of October 5th, we have 35 million cases. Now cases are based on national reporting and clearly they're way over, uh, under evaluated, right? We're probably two or three times higher than that in reality. Um, and we have passed 1 million deaths at the global level. Um, this is by region. Uh, so a great number, the biggest numbers are in the Americas that include both North and South America. Europe, uh, Europe and Southeast Asia are next. Um, and then Eastern Mediterranean region, 
African region and Western Pacific region. Uh, we don't see here uh, East Asia. Uh, and East Asia is, is basically too close to zero. So those are uh, data from uh, WHO that's reproduced by Statista. Statista sorry. Uh, this is a uh, number of cases per day since the beginning of the pandemic. And basically we're still rising. Um, we are, you know, so, so it's an ever growing graph. We haven't yet started uh, receding. And per day. Uh, this is uh, a graph from the Financial Times that they published today, which shows uh, the change in regional uh, focus of COVID. So initially, of course, we know it started in China and then Europe was the biggest uh, uh, target, uh, then the US. Um, and then in recent months, we've seen Brazil and the rest of Latin America and Mexico growing very fast. They almost half the cases. Uh, US remains large. India has been rising very fast as well. And Africa remains small. Um, and the rest of Asia is small as well. Uh, so this is the current data for the top G20 economies, but this is G20 in terms of size of the economy. So not exactly the G20 group, but the top 20 economies. Uh, the key point here is that uh, the top three, uh, that is US, India, and Brazil, represent 52% of new cases as of today. You know, we have an average number of cases on a seven day average here per day. So we are 292,000 right now on average. Um, and of those 52% are in either US, India or Brazil. Uh, and 45% of all deaths recorded so far are in those three countries. Uh, we see also great differences. So when you get to the bottom of this, uh, South Korea, Australia, Switzerland, Japan, China, Netherlands, and then Canada uh, are those with the uh, smallest numbers, both deaths and cases. Uh, this is the chart for US states in comparison to uh, other countries. What we found here is that it's very diverse among US states. Uh, and in particular, there's a few states where things are rising very fast now. And there are actually, if they were a state, if they were a country, they would be among the top 10 of the world. That include North Dakota, South Dakota, where we are now. Uh, those are the cases per day. Uh, Utah, Montana, etc. So there's a lot of uh, differentiation. Uh, and today, it's not anymore just New York, California, and Florida. There is a spread that's gone to more isolated, more rural states. Um, so now, uh, in terms of, there's three more lessons on the health side before I move to the economic side. Um, we basically uh, know very well, we have known for years, what threat we could expect in terms of pandemic. Uh, and uh, the book by Osterholm and Olshaker, 2017, uh, detailed very clearly that the two biggest health risks on the planet are on the left side, flu risks, and on the right side, coronavirus risks. And the book was saying, those are the things that are gonna hit us probably within the next five years, one or the other. And in fact, they had a case study with a scenario of, a, of a, they picked a flu, but coming out of China and they picked Shanghai in the book. And then they show how there'd be a lack of PPE, uh, personal protection equipment in Europe and North America. Nobody had enough of those. There'll be a battle for vaccines. There will be all kinds of geopolitical tensions. So we're basically following the scenario of the book as it was written. Uh, it's important to see those are the two viruses that are the most prevalent, the most likely to come again. Uh, and they have different sources for coronaviruses just like we had uh, SARS and we had MERS before, they come from bats. All of them come from bats. There's a large reservoir of bats in China, but also in other countries that include uh, most of the world, in fact. And bats uh, are eaten in turn by other animals like snakes or pangolin, um, or they sometimes share food. And then when those animals are eaten by humans, this is how it comes to humans. Uh, so this is one big threat uh, for humans, and in particular, it happens when bats and remote caves are being disturbed by humans, or bats are being uh, pursued or eaten or whatever. Uh, the other channel of risk uh, is through industrial pigs and chickens. 
all flus that hit us, including the 1919 Spanish flu, uh, came from pigs. In fact, the, Sp the, the Spanish flu of 1919, which killed between 50 and 100 million people, uh, came from the Midwest, probably from Kansas in America. Uh, the H1N1 flu of 2009 also came from the Midwest in America. Uh, and so those flus come when uh, at, they are in the same location, uh, large numbers of pigs and large number of chickens, because all flus come originally from chickens and are transmitted to pigs, and pigs are sort of the industrial factory that transform an avian flu into a human flu. Only pigs can do that. Uh, and so the, the, the recommendation is to separate uh, the farming of pigs from the farming of chickens, and that would probably make it much less likely to have a giant flu pandemic. In any case, we have a major vulnerability globally on those two tracks here. Uh, and all of them involve not just human health, but animal health and what we call zoonotics. Uh, and a lot of research, a lot of books have been published on this. And so this was well known, but we never acted on this uh, before this uh, pandemic. So uh, second big point is there are great differences in pandemic outcomes per country. And the most reliable data that we can use is death per million. Because in a way, uh, the number of cases uh, depend on the number of tests. And so since tests are not done at an equal rate everywhere, it's very hard to draw too many lessons from the number of, of uh, cases. But for death, it's uh, harder to, uh, to hide or to, uh, or to lie about. Um, so this is the ranking as of today. Uh, based on John, Hop John Hopkins University data. Uh, the highest death rate today is Peru with 1,000 per million. Um, next, then I skip, I've, I've targeted a few of the bigger countries, skipping a few countries that had less reliable data. Uh, Brazil is very high at 691. Spain remains very high. Ecuador, UK, US are three among the highest, uh, top seven or eight of the world. Mexico is soon after. Italy is uh, better now in comparison to Spain. Then Sweden, France, and for Canada, Quebec is up here. So Quebec is actually higher than UK or US uh, and is equal to Spain. Um, so that's why I put it here as a provincial number. So those are the high death rate countries, those that have in a way been less good at containing the disease. Uh, middle death rate countries, Canada, Switzerland, Israel, Russia, Germany, Austria, Hungary, India, Norway, Indonesia, and then Ontario is about 200. Uh, BC is at 47. So Ontario will be near the top here uh, and BC at the bottom. And then the low death rate countries, the highest performance countries, Australia, Pakistan, Senegal. I picked some uh, you know, well-known cases that have actually managed very well. Japan, Cuba, South Korea, New Zealand, Singapore, China, Thailand, Vietnam, and Taiwan. And Vietnam and Taiwan are the two lowest in the world. So the best performance. Uh, you know, in Thailand, remarkable here. Uh, as you can see also, in both the high countries and the low countries, we find a mix of democracies and authoritarian countries. So in that sense, there is, from a political perspective, there is diversity of outcomes. Um, a symbolic moment is this just a photo. This is the giant Wuhan pool party with tens of thousands of people on August 15 with zero cases uh, uh, tracked because this was done after the entire population was tested. And there is not a single case left in Wuhan at that point. Uh, so no country has done such massive, massive testing. Um, the third thing is we did have, before the COVID crisis, a ranking of global pandemic preparedness, which was done conjunctly uh, by John Hopkins University, by the Economist Intelligence Unit, and other organizations. And they ranked on six scores, prevention, detection, rapid response, health system, compliance with global norms, and risk environment. And they put a score on everything. And they decided which country would do best if they were hit by a pandemic based on their institutional endowment, what they had. You could see number one was the US, number two was UK. Then you had Australia, uh, Netherlands, and Canada. Thailand is very high. Korea was high. France, Germany. France higher than Germany because of a very, very good health system. So this was the expectation. 
as you can see, this ranking doesn't match the ranking I just showed in terms of performance during COVID. And that creates the puzzle. Why is there a mismatch between actor performance by countries in this COVID pandemic and uh, the original institutional endowments that those countries had? And so we can create this kind of table. So I created this. Uh, you can go the GHS index, low, medium, or high, and then the death rate, low, medium, or high. And so you can see those countries where success was no big control of the disease. Germany, Switzerland, South Korea, and Japan, Taiwan, and British Columbia as a province. Uh, those countries where we expected hardships, and we do find hardships. The numbers are hard. I mean, they're not fully, uh, not as good as in, in the, the high performance countries. Indonesia, India, Russia, Italy, which had a much lower number uh, in terms of uh, the health uh, security uh, index. Uh, but Italy was initially overwhelmed, but since the summer has become a very strong performer. So Italy is a fascinating case. Then we have the unusual cases, the overperformers and the underperformers relative to the institutional capacity. So overperformers that do better than we would expect, Vietnam, China, Pakistan, Senegal, Cote d'Ivoire, Mauritius, and much of Africa, in fact, Mongolia and Uruguay. On the underperformers, those that should have controlled much better and didn't, US, UK, France, Sweden, and for Canada, at least Quebec, and to some extent, Ontario, given that Canada was ranked the highest, uh, among the highest top five of all performers, uh, and Brazil, of course. Um, the uh, WHO and the World Economic Forum produced uh, a special feature in September about seven countries we can all learn from, that is seven countries that were super performers, despite you know, uh, relative weaker institutional capacities. And so those were Thailand, Italy, Mauritius, Uruguay, Pakistan, and Vietnam. So that shows one of the puzzles of this pandemic, right? It's not just those that are rich with the best healthcare system and the best uh, data and the best, uh, you know, CDC that ended up performing the best. Uh, some countries surprised the world by uh, mobilizing the few resources they have extremely efficiently and organizing the entire country extremely efficiently. Um, so what are the clues? How to solve this puzzle? Well, uh, here are a few, a few facts that we, can, uh, that we could put our fingers on. Uh, I call it the emerging factors for good performance in COVID. Number one is, of course, still the institutional health capacity that you have at the beginning, the endowments, the medical capacity, the testing capacity, central command, good legal capacity, et cetera. Second, uh, the presence of a competent, non-politicized government action that relies on science and data and coordinates all levels. So good coordination and good integration of medical data, putting uh, you know, medical experts on the front in terms of uh, tracking the data and announcing the data. Uh, third, uh, trust in government. So there's both a long-term aspect, different societies have low or high trust in their government, uh, and also their parties and dimensions uh, when there is a very controversial government in power. Um, and then finally, and here I want to call on uh, the great research from my colleague, Heidi Twarek in history at UBC and her co-authors uh, who just produced a report on effective empowering communication, uh, democratic communication, uh, looking at nine jurisdictions that have done particularly well. They identify five factors that explain when there was effective communication which basically helped the performance. Uh, and the five factors are autonomy, not orders. So rely on the autonomy of citizens rather than order them attend to value emotion and stories, pull in the citizens and civil society, institutionalize communication, and use democratic terminology. So there's a fascinating uh, study here uh, in, in the dialogue between government and society uh, in actually through communication uh, in making sure that society plays a good partnership with the government. Uh, and so communication has been critical uh, in doing this. Um, good example, uh, this is something I took a picture of in rural BC, uh, not in Vancouver. Uh, and so we have a narrative coming straight from the top from a very respected leader. By the way, we could add maybe uh, a, 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 a fifth factor to my list, 
you know, pending further research, but it seems that there is also gender dimension. So far, there is no country where the leader is a woman who has not done pretty well uh, with COVID. And in fact, all those uh, countries with female leaders have outperformed in general, have been among the top performers. That include uh, Tsai Ing-wen in Taiwan, uh, Merkel in, uh, in Germany, uh, and uh, New Zealand, etc., uh, and several in Europe. Uh, there have been a list of interesting innovative policy actions that have explained success. Uh, of course, there's all the aspect of epidemic preparation and places like Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, partly China were particularly well prepared. Then rapid reaction, very rapid action, uh, the change of mode from routine mode to emergency mode. Here too, we find great, action, great uh, example in Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, Austria, Germany. Uh, preparation in terms of uh, PPE, test production, vaccine search, uh, Korea, Taiwan, China, Germany come to mind here as doing very, very well. Uh, then there is the controversial piece, contact tracing. Uh, and here we find not just China, but also Korea, Taiwan, Singapore uh, deploying contact tra tracing incredibly fast, you know, within a couple of weeks and using it in a very, very far reaching way, which actually goes beyond what we accept in Canada in terms of privacy, but which has been incredibly effective in reducing death and the spread of COVID. Um, so, and you know, as, as I speak, we still don't have the app in BC uh, for contact tracing. Uh, fifth is social support, community activities and social capital, uh, the mobilization of trust and transparency. Uh, here too, we find uh, all this happening in the in the countries listed. And then uh, there's the economic dimension, rapid economic reaction and support. And here we find Canada and the US doing very well, as well as Korea uh, and, and others. Um, vaccine, a final note to uh, finish the health chapter here. Uh, we are in the midst of the biggest vaccine competition ever seen on the planet. There are currently 169 type, and that's already a month ago outdated, uh, 169 candidates, 30 uh, of which are in clinical trials uh, and the rest under development. So that's a very, very large numbers. Uh, they use different methods and they come from different countries. Uh, so there's Moderna from the US, there is uh, Germany, uh, Shanghai Pharma School in China, Imperial College in UK, another one in Germany, uh, another one in China. Uh, using RNA vaccine and DNA vaccine. We have US, South Korea, uh, Japan, India, uh, and then viral vector vaccine. We have AstraZeneca and Oxford in the UK. Uh, we have another one in China and one in Russia. Uh, so there's all kind of method. We have never seen something like this ever on the planet. Um, in terms of academic papers, there has also been the biggest uh, research competition and output of peer reviewed data uh, ever in terms of a, a, a pandemic and the leaders are China, the US. Italy incredibly high, by the way. Uh, this is from Nikkei, uh, Nihonkei Zashimbun in Japan. Uh, in terms of spending, there is an unleashing of spending. The US has spent 10 billions of public money, as we know, to subsidize the vaccine development. As far as is estimated by Nikkei, China has spent $143 billion. Uh, so an enormous unleashing of, uh, of money uh, for vaccine uh, research. Um, so that closes the health chapter. What we get from this is there's a huge differential uh, uh, outcome among countries. And in fact, we can track what are the components that explain success and, uh, and failure. Uh, now I'm turning to the economy because the COVID-19 shock is also an enormous economic shock. And the big takeaway here is a shock of this magnitude that has shut down a third of the global economy for the first time in human history is generating enormous losers and winners. It's an enormous life experiment on, you know, on the world economy. Uh, and countries that spend all the money that's being spent now wisely will emerge as winners. Those who don't spend wisely, or we spend it uh, you know, uh, in, the, in the wrong direction that are not very productive, will pay a price over time. So this is the, the moment where all the cards are being reshuffled. Also the speed of success with COVID means uh, uh, that the reopening of the economy is faster. 
and countries that are faster will end up uh, growing faster and earlier uh, and winning points in the global race. Um, so this is a very competitive environment. At the domestic level, what we can say is this crisis is generating enormous stress, enormous inequality, uh, inequality across different uh, sectors. For example, the less uh, the, the, the jobs that are not easily done from home, uh, more in the services or in production, uh, have suffered more greatly than those that can move up uh, uh, Technologies. Uh, there is a great differential impact. About 30 40 of society in North America is worse affected than the rest of society. They have seen the greater loss of income. Uh, we see, of course, also an acceleration of digital transformation. Um, you know, probably some people are, are smiling, saying we see 10 years of digital transformation happening within weeks. Right? We have just really accelerated. We see also the largest increase in debt ever in a, in one year period. It's even more than in 2008, 2009 during the global financial crisis. Uh, so the quality of spending will make huge difference over time. So it's critical to not just span to save the economy and save you no know, 30% of society from collapsing, but it has to be very wisely spanned without uh, excess and of course putting productive future oriented uh, you know, uh, operations, including uh, the shift toward green, uh, a green economy. Um, at the global level, we find that the speed in tackling the virus translates in faster recovery. And there's one dramatic effect from this. Uh, according to the IMF World Economic Outlook, the cumulative growth in China for 2020 and 2021, even including the, Q, the second quarter decrease that they experience, will be about 10%. You know, it's about 1% to 2% in 2020 and about 8% in 2021. Whereas in the US, and in fact, most of the OECD, the, the total for the two years will be minus 4%. Will be a minus. I think I missed my minus here. So the US will be minus 4% over two years, China plus 10%. The net outcome is the China US GDP ratio will increase from 65% in 2019 to 75 or 80% by the end of 2021. So that's the great irony of this crisis here is that because China shut down much faster and controlled COVID much faster, it ends up uh, getting an advantage in terms of global economic gravity in the world relative to the US. Um, March 20 was an enormous shock. Uh, we have never seen something like this before. You know, the second quarter in the US saw minus 35% growth, a massive recession. Of course, it was short. Uh, and unemployment has increased by 11 million people in the U.S. by summer 2020. So those are examples of how big the shock has been. Um, and those are estimates. So the IMF will give the latest estimates later this week. So I can't have the October data. I have only the June data here. Uh, but what you can see is the you know, quarter by quarter, the economic impact. And you see China here uh, hit first, but not as deep and then coming out, uh, and then the others. So we have the world in black. In red, we have emerging economies, with, not China. And then in blue, the advanced economies. So the advanced economy in Q2 had a bigger shock. And then even by the end of 2021, will still be negative territory, will not have fully recovered. Um, so that's the global impact. Uh, another impact is that, by and large, is not just China, but the whole of East Asia is coming out of this crisis on top because they uh, controlled it faster. Uh, so Hami Karas, who tablets data at Brookings on the global middle class, uh, sent me this note uh, mid-June. He said that COVID will probably reduce the speed of middle class expansion by about one year, expecting a V-shaped rebound, essentially. But all the growth will be in Asia because Asia seems to be dealing better than the rest of the world with COVID. Uh, however, there is still uncertainty about South Asia, India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. Uh, so, and that story is still unfolding, so it's too early to say in terms of South Asia. Um, so those are the detailed numbers, uh, and you can see country by country, so I can highlight uh, Canada here. Uh, Canada is expected in 2020 to be minus 8.4 and rebound 4.9% or 5% in 2021. 
Um, so that's what the IMF is estimating, uh, which is a relatively good number. The US uh, estimated to be minus 8% in 2020 and plus 4.5% in 2021. Um, that's, then we have seen the biggest fiscal response ever here too, right? Even faster than in 2008, uh, 2008 2009, uh, but it's not been equal. So the biggest numbers are from the right here. Uh, so United States has had the biggest additional spending or revenue foregone, uh, you know, more than 10% of GDP, 12%. And that's even before the next uh, tranche, which has not been agreed as we know right now. Next is Japan, uh, then Germany, uh, then Australia, Brazil, etc. Canada has spent a lot, but it's only 7% or so. So it's actually in the middle of the pack, in terms of big economies. Uh, and India or... Uh, China uh, on the lower side of uh, the spending. China is about three, four uh, percent. So those are the additional, and then there's also additional loans, particularly strong in Japan and Germany, uh, less so in the US, also in the UK. UK is on the high side here. And of course, this would not have been possible without something extraordinary, again, which was the central banks. Most of that debt is bought by the central banks through a massive QE. Uh, and so you find those numbers, if you look at BOJ, the BOJ now owns 40% of all debt outstanding in Japan uh, and has bought the majority of all the new debt issued for COVID. Uh, the ECB has had a huge jump and the Fed was slow initially on March 9, they took a week because initially the Fed considered the biggest risk in, uh, in, in its mandate, right? The, their mandate is to reduce monetary risk and risk in the economy, the biggest risk was the actions of the US president. So they were kind of paralyzed as documented by Adam Tooze. But once it became clear that COVID was such a massive shock, then they opened uh, the spigot and they also went into massive QE, which continues to now. So they're probably way beyond 25% now of debt outstanding. Uh, so we basically that's how we're surviving now. Uh, we're holding because of exceptional fiscal spending and exceptional monetary, uh, uh, monetary policy, which is buying all that debt, right? Um, and of course, we have a huge jump in debt. Uh, and so that's the change in global government debt because of COVID. And so we see that uh, there's about 20%, and that's at the global level. So we see a 20% of GDP increase in global debt because of COVID. That compares to 10% during the global financial crisis in 2008. So we have done twice as much. Uh, and that's extraordinary, right? We've never seen numbers like this uh, in modern history. Um, and so then you get to uh, exceptional numbers in terms of debt shock. Essentially, the way to measure the shock is to measure uh, this column here, which is debt over GDP and you compare it to the estimation of 2020 and 2021. What you find is for all advanced economies, they are going through a plus 25% of GDP increase in debt. 25%, right, which is enormous. For the US is 30%, for Canada is 20%. Less than the US, but nonetheless big. Canada is going from 88% to 108% over those two years. Uh, for Japan is 30%. Uh, so this is the debt shock we're going through. Most likely it will be followed in 2021 by a big adjustment, right? By at least a deceleration of the increase in debt. Uh, so hopefully we'll be, uh, we'll be uh, stabilized by high growth, but we can't be sure. Um, so clearly humanity is at a crossroad because we have an open economy which requires, uh, which is a bit like a bicycle. We don't have provisions for stopping. Our resilience is low. Uh, we always need speed, connectivity, uh, we need tankers and containers everywhere, uh, and we have, low, uh, uh, you know, we have low capacity to deal with systemic risk. Uh, and so that's why there has been such a fiscal response uh, in key countries, but we are still in an uncertain uh, phase in terms of predicting the future. Um, so that's the economy. My other five points are fast, uh, a few key points on the politics and the global governance. Uh, so point number four, global governance has been missing in action. And that's a huge difference with 2008-2009. In 2008-2009, 
coordination among the big economies, particularly within the G20, saved the day. They agreed to completely double the resources of IMF. They created uh, new organizations. They agreed on global rules. They coordinated macroeconomic policies. They did not engage in protectionism. So they basically supported each other for recovery. Today, we have most global governance organizations failing and misperforming. Uh, that includes the G7, G20, NATO, the UN uh, Security Council, the, new, uh, the UN General Assembly, uh, and WTO. They're all underperforming. And this is our defense system. Uh, part functioning below the scale of what we need, the IMF, the World Bank, regional development banks, and to some extent, the WHO, which has been a critical player now in building the COVAX alliance, etc. Why do we see such failure? Well, number one cause is Donald Trump, which has been launching a massive assault on every global institution. So the proximate reason why the G7 or G20 cannot function now is the US veto. Uh, and in fact, they have even canceled several meetings uh, in a row. Uh, the second reason is the US-China tensions, a very intense US-China tensions, and in fact, tit for tat actions between the two of them, including bad actions from China. Um, the big lesson from this, the US is more critical to the global system than anyone ever dreamt. So if the US says no to global coordination, the system fails. We can't do without the US, and the US is not playing ball right now. Um, impact of this, we see a significant erosion of institutional capacity relative to global forces and global market. And so we have a, a potential cascade effects that can be triggered in the coming months and years. Uh, fifth point, democracies, but in fact, all regimes are under duress. COVID-19 is acting like a pressure cooker uh, and frustrations are piling up because we see unequal health impact, unequal economic impact, and that creates a recipe for tensions. We also see that social, the social media era unleashes emotions and echo chambers, which make you know, the sense of building a common society or common unity more difficult. In such context, when you have a massive health and economic crisis, many societies can be vulnerable to strong men. Uh, and that's the story of the 1930s. Um, so this is a period of great uncertainty, volatility, and risks. We see the potential of dem demagogues coming to power using people's anxieties for power through dangerous or suicidal recipes. Um, and two great political scientists from Harvard, Levitsky and Ziblatt, in their 2018 book, uh, When Democracy Dies, have made a poignant call for mutual accommodation within democracies and institutional forbearance among the different components of democracies for democracy to, to sustain itself and to survive. So this is a moment where democracies have to perform that, have to find ways to accommodate different interests and different voices uh, and to experience institutional forbearance. COVID is a litmus test for the resilience of democracies it's essential to protect institutions while dealing with COVID-19. Point six, uh, COVID, because it has generated such a, a, a multifaceted crisis of such speed and uncertainty, has generated what I call, I, I call the fog of COVID. It's similar to the fog of war during war. Uh, and so essentially is disorder and this fog of disorder, there is increased geopolitical risks and they are opportunistic actions by strong leaders and strong men uh, who take advantage of this period of chaos. Uh, number one, at a time of such risk and such danger for the global system, uh, what's striking is unlike 2008, unlike most earlier period except the 1930s, the leaders of the two top countries are not meeting. They are not talking. US-China diplomacy is frozen at this critical time. There's no meeting at the top. The only functioning channel between the US and China now, ironically, is in trade. It's between Bob Lighthizer and, um, and Liu He. Uh, other channels are not working. There was a brief meeting in Hawaii between Pompeo uh, and uh, the head of the diplomacy on China, 
uh, from the Politburo, but uh, essentially they, it was two monologues. They essentially lectured each other and there was no movement and no, uh, uh, no understanding, no uh, even development of protocol to avoid uh, you no know, risks of war, for example. Um, we find also that Zoom and high-tech method digital economy does not really work for diplomacy and summits. Uh, you know, the, what we see of G7, G20 summits and other summits, they do those short thing online on Zoom and then there's no corridor diplomacy. They don't eat and drink together. They don't chat on the side and it's very uh, rigid. And so they just reaffirm their points. And the EU was essentially having a hard time whenever it was online uh, from March to June. In July, it finally had a real meeting with, for three days. And that's when they had this incredible breakthrough when they essentially turned the lemon of COVID into an advantage for building the EU and uh, starting euro bonds, which they had refused to do before. Um, social media makes things worse. Uh, we, we see an increase in misperceptions. We see China unhinged this year, uh, essentially apparently following a bottom line mentality with nothing to lose, right? So China has been accelerating risk taking, such as the overreach in Hong Kong, the wolf warrior diplomacy, uh, the actions with India, the acceleration in Xinjiang, and in fact, even in Mongolia, acceleration of repression in Xinjiang, including as well in Tibet and Mongolia. And it seems to think that since there is no upside whatsoever with the US, or with global community, this is the time to consolidate the state and to act purely on national security. Uh, and, and so clearly we see actions that from an international strategy perspective are not even rational, but more domestically driven. The US is also unhinged. Um, we see uh, an acceleration of the narrative of decoupling, ideological conflict, and a focus on you know, one, one day after the other, incredible speeches uh, that include a lot of things that are not factual, but it becomes like drinking its own Kool-Aid and it tends to horrify the rest of the world, such as Europeans, Latin Americans, et cetera. Uh, we have real risks of US-China war today due to potential mistakes in the South China Sea or in the Taiwan Straits. Uh, and this conflict is currently overwhelming global politics. Uh, and that's the result of all this period of chaos and lack of dialogue and lack of agreement on even the protocols that the US and Soviet Union had during the Cold War. Uh, we have seen a China-India conflict, which makes no sense. Uh, it's irrational, uh, especially on the Chinese side. And so it's probably due only uh, to domestic politics and posturing by you know, PLA actors or others who want to have a bigger budget or who want, who want to uh, strengthen their position in the current, uh, in the current regime. Uh, we see adventurism by Turkey, uh, including uh, the role that Turkey played in uh, fanning the Azerbaijan-Armenia conflict, but also in Libya, et cetera, and Syria. Um, so the lessons here, the fog of COVID, it's not the, the actual direct cause for those crises that I'm describing, but it's creating a, a cover for a lot of opportunistic security driven or aggressive actions by a lot of strong men. Uh, and they can only be counteracted by positive leaders uh, who, have, who decide to cooperate and who have a sense of strategy with what they're doing. Um, this is a quote from Margaret Macmillan, uh, our Canadian great historian uh, in the September-October uh, foreign affairs issue. And she writes, the history of the first half of the 20th century demonstrates all too vividly that unchecked or unmoderated tensions can lead to extremism at home and conflict abroad. It also shows that at times of heightened tensions, accidents can set off explosions like a spark in a powder keg, especially if countries in those moments of crisis lack wise and capable leadership. Had Franz Ferdinand not been assassinated in Sarajevo in June 1914, World War I might not have erupted. One can only imagine the chain of potentially catastrophic events that could be set in motion today if Chinese and American naval ships or airplanes collided in the South China Sea. So this is a stern warning from uh, one of our great historians. Um, and clearly there's a clash of narratives. In period of uncertainty, societies 
look for focal points and domestic narratives provide those focal points and they build on history to provide guidance on the presence. The problem is that those national narratives generate parallel realities and parallel meanings among countries and basically pull countries apart. Uh, at best, they are misunderstood by other players and they generate misperceptions. At worst, those, the narrative of the others create a sense of threat and trigger a kind of fight or flight behavior in other countries. Uh, and so we find a lot of research in this domain, for example, with Akeloff and Schiller on the impact of narratives. That's what, what I'm personally most worried about because I see the rise of those narratives that are more especially in the US and China, but around the world in general. Um, that's a warning from the French foreign minister back in April. Uh, he said, we hope that we're gonna have a better world after COVID. Uh, however, my fear is that the world afterwards will be very much like the one before, only worse, uh, because we can see uh, the fight for international order under COVID is a continuation by other means of the struggle among powers uh, and more challenge to multilateralism. Um, that's the last big summit that took place. Uh, that was the EU-China summit online. Uh, it was cold, it was very cold. We have seen a dramatic uh, uh, tightening in the EU-China relation as everywhere around China, but at least they were talking. We don't even have this between the US and China. Um, point seven, uh, regionalism is picking up some of the slack. Oops, sorry. Uh, and that's part of the good news. So there's a bit of good news here. The EU has managed to uh, create a breakthrough, launching a 700 billion euro, euro bond, uh, common borrowing to help countries hit by COVID. And apparently the plan is that 190 billion of this will go to Italy. And in fact, Italy appears safe now and is bouncing back due to its own action, but also support of the EU. So while the EU was in dire crisis in March, uh, it has turned around and we find more and more coordination within the EU. Um, second, Africa is holding up so far. We find a lot of countries doing well on the COVID in Africa. Third, uh, we find resilience in Asia. The supply chains and networks are reshuffling somewhat, you know, in, with building parallel supply chains with and without China, but by and large, the reshuffling of the pulling out of China is small. You know, it's the order of five, seven percent uh, for Western companies. Uh, and all Asian countries are still deeply uh, uh, rooted in the belief in an open global economy and in globalization. So there is no one uh, in Asia that's looking for decoupling, not even Japan, for example. Um, and so there's a lot of resilience in this global economic integration in Asia. Um, we also find something remarkable. The China-led AIB and the Japan-led ADB, as well as the World Bank, have uh, experienced unprecedented cooperation, concentrating together on all their resources instead of doing it on infrastructure or whatever. They have put everything together on COVID relief in Asia. So we find actually an incredibly good coordination on the ground between Japan and China, essentially, uh, in terms of development relief. And the fact that Japan is so involved you know, in advising, you know, the AIB taking the Japanese advice means that uh, it's higher quality. Um, point eight, we also see another piece of good news, innovative minilateralism by middle powers uh, as a type of effective multilateralism while the US and China are fighting essentially. So we find lots of joint declarations, incredible fluidity in communication. There is more communication among foreign ministers in the world today than ever before. And Canada is uh, in, right in the, in the heart of this. Uh, we see the alliance of multilateralism with 48 countries, including Canada, all the most Europeans and Japan. Uh, we have seen the EU in Canada leading uh, a workaround to save the WTO dispute settlement. It's a temporary workaround while the US has blocked it and they essentially destroyed the dispute settlement mechanism, but at least it's holding somewhat the system. Um, Japan is missing here and that's a problem. Uh, we have seen a burst of action coming from Japan, uh, both on trade, but also with the free and open Indo-Pacific vision, which is multi-track, right? It's both a security hedge rule of law hedge and economic integration in Asia. 
Um, but uh, those initiatives, while uh, being important, uh, face an uphill effort because they lack the critical mass so far and the political muscle. Uh, the problem number one is the US is central to all global governance and the US is fiercely opposed to all those mechanisms right now. Number two, China uh, is embroiled in that China-US spiral. And so everyone is worried about China and China is doing all kinds of security related actions. Uh, and so the key question is, can the middle powers and essentially the G18 save the rules-based order, especially in case of a Trump re-election? Uh, can they get critical mass effect and essentially neutralize the destructive effect for the rules-based order of a Trump re-election? Um, we don't know that. That's the picture of the alliance for multilateralism. Uh, so there was uh, 48, I think, participants. That was uh, last week. Uh, so you see something of a novel kind here, which is interesting and worth studying. Um, the goal is to renew global commitment to rules-based order uh, and to be quite proactive. Um, on 25th of September, they endorse a common declaration to building back better the world and multilateral institutions, including climate, health, digital tech, and gender equality. So there's a lot of inspiring documents. The problem is uh, it doesn't yet have critical mass effect. Uh, what we need is this huge moment to keep the system going, uh, avoid collapse, and engineer a more resilient, thinner, more diverse system uh, that can maybe reform globalization without a collapse. Uh, so this is a critical moment uh, in global governance. And final point, uh, in a time of great transition, great uncertainty, great uh, chaos, uh, essentially we are in a world where we cannot just rely on institutions because they're all under stress, then leaders become essential. Um, all global institutions, norms, and standing operating procedures today are eroded or damaged. The exception are the regional institutions holding well in Europe, Asia, and Africa. Leadership is essential today to stem the unraveling of the liberal international order or the rules-based international order. Uh, conversely, bad or weak leaders can make things worse. The story, uh, as studied by Macmillan of the 1930s, was a situation of chaos like this where bad leaders showed up, you know, Hitler and others, and they turned this bad situation into a nightmare. Uh, so we have to hope that this doesn't happen, uh, but this is a danger moment for the global system. Uh, in conclusion, COVID-19 is a game changer because of its timing at a time of a perfect storm and global cooperation in crisis. It's having great differential effects domestically and globally. It's a health crisis, it's a social crisis, it's an economy crisis. It's also a pressure cooker for security and geopolitical tensions. It enables opportunistic and dangerous moves and crisis under the fog of the COVID crisis. Ruthless actors have space to act unchecked. There is therefore urgency for powerful innovative leadership to avoid the tragedy of history and to rebuild a common institutional order. Tit for tat downward spir spirals should be avoided at this point. But I cannot emphasize how much is riding essentially on the US election. Uh, and so the whole world has been glued to this uh, drama at this point. Thank you very much. Great. Well, that was a very fantastic presentation. Thank you so much, Professor Jabergian, for coming in and uh, giving that presentation. So I guess we're moving on to the next part of our event, which will be open Q&A for members of our audience, who I'm sure many of them are applauding while they're watching us um, from home. So in, in kind of the bottom row of Zoom, please feel free to submit um, typed questions uh, at the Q&A um, icon. Um, I'll, I'll get started with one question, uh, knowing that, uh, Professor, you're probably too modest to mention, but do you have any big upcoming books or publications that might be able to delve a bit further into your thoughts and ideas on kind of this geopolitical response to the COVID-19 crisis? Thank you, Emmett. Yes, I have a book uh, in under writing now for Cambridge uh, on the geopolitics of COVID. It will be uh, most. It would have a heavy focus on Asia, uh, and it's due actually to uh, you know if, if the peer review is successful, it will be on a fast track, and it will come out early next year, 2021. 
so, but I have to turn the manuscript in after the US election. Initially it was before, but then they say, we don't want it before the US election because it has too much impact. Uh, so I'll have to wait for the outcome of the US election. <laughs> And I'm doing another uh, one on the global order in transition, but that's uh, COVID and beyond. Wow, yeah. So, of course, lots of thoughts, lots of ideas. I think this is definitely a topic that's very much on the top of everyone's minds, especially um, our attendees at our CIC events who, are, who do pay very, very close attention to what's happening in geopolitics and global governance and the like. So I'm seeing some first question just coming in right now. So the first question that I have is from Benjamin Strawthought, and, he, and he's asking, how do we kind of deal with China's recent behavior, as you put it, and as it is a growing topic of debate in Canadian politics, and what do you think Canada's specific place is in responding to China? Yeah, so it's, it's hard, right? They, it's really hard. Uh, um, because, so in the very, very big picture, uh, it's of course critical to defend, uh, you know, for any country to defend itself against any security threat. So we know that there are particular uh, risks for Canada in terms of uh, security threat infiltration and all this. So Canada, of course, has to respond to all this. Uh, then there are uh, issues of potential threats in the region uh, where, of course, Canada's allies and is involved, right? And so, of course, it's part of that. Uh, and then there are the human rights violations. So especially Xinjiang and the overreach in Hong Kong, which um, you know, most Canadians are angry about and shocking. And we have the question of arbitrary detention of the two Michaels uh, and many other questions. So for those, of course, um, there, there is um, you know, a need to do something, but calibrating the action to make sure it has a positive impact on the situation is important. Uh, and so some actions may have counter effects for the people we want to help. And that's the critical thing. Not, nonetheless, so that's where the whole debate on sanctions comes in, Magnitsky sanction. Um, and um, in the short term, it's likely to have a negative effects because there will be a tit for tat response. And if anything, it might encourage further repression. In the long term, however, that's why myself, I'm, I keep thinking about this. In the long term, it may still be important to stand for impunity in, in the rules-based order. Uh, and so it's, it, there is a case for it. Uh, just the same way that we should uh, always support the ICC, the International Criminal Court, and therefore probably oppose the US effort on destroying the International Criminal Court. The, the general logic here is the same. That is, we want to uh, uh, prevent impunity in uh, you know, egregious crimes that involve the destruction of either culture or the killing of vast numbers of people. Um, so Canada has to stand for its principle. But at the same time, however, uh, you know, given the kind of crisis where we're in at the global level, uh, and we are facing pretty soon the acceleration of climate change, which, you know, already in 10 years will, will be pretty horrifying, even on the ground in terms of forest fires and everything, we are forced to also keep diplomatic channels and ability to cooperate with all players, including China, which is 28% of global emission, on issues like climate. And we need to retain the ability to have protocols to avoid war, for example. Uh, just like the Soviet Union and the US had, we still need arms control agreements. We need a whole bunch of things of common interests. So the challenge is to defend ourselves, to stand up uh, on what we can uh, for global values and global norms, uh, you know, and, uh, and of course, be together with allies. Uh, and on the other hand, keep a channel for critical communication and diplomacy where, where we just can't avoid it. Mm. Great. Yeah. So it seems like there's a lot of people that are very interested in kind of knowing about kind of the Canada-China or United States-China relationship kind of in the face of this COVID-19 uh, pandemic. But I think moving on, I think more to more uh, closer, closer to home to your presentation. I think one, one question that uh, is being asked by Laurie Remeyer, I hope I pronounced that correctly, is where do you think Canada can further use its leverage as a cooperative player and major economy over the next year while managing domestic tensions? Right, so as far as I can see, the biggest uh, variable for Canada is the US election. Uh, because if we have a Biden administration, uh, they have announced that they want to re-enter the global order, right? So essentially they want 
to work with WTO, with WHO, with, uh, you know, with NATO, with, and they want to work with allies. So under Biden administration, Canada, of course, then works actively with the U.S., uh, in both tasks that I was describing, that is, well, managing the global economy, pushing back where there are dangers and threats uh, that are common, and uh, also working uh, maybe together in uh, addressing global public goods and global bads like climate change and others, where we need to work with China, but do it together. So essentially, on the Biden administration, Canada has a lot of space to work with the U.S. and Europe and Japan, etc. Under a Trump administration, we reach uh, a second Trump administration. That's where we reach uh, maximum danger, because uh, you know, according to all likelihood, Trump may pull out of the WTO, may pull out of NATO, uh, and so the order that we have known uh, that defends Canada will be under great threat. And so the question then will be: uh, Do we continue what we're doing now, which is minilateralism, lots of coalitions of the willing, working with Europeans here, working with you know, different countries, with the UK on joint declaration, or do we step up the game uh, with EU, Japan, and everyone else, and trying to save a global trading system, uh, save uh, you know an alliance? Uh, and so the the game is very different uh, according to what happens in the US. Um, very good. So our next question comes from Eden, and then she, I believe, uh, they're asking, as you foreshadowed in your introduction, how has COVID affected global climate governance coordination and leadership, especially related to China's rise as a climate leader and the United States withdrawal from the Paris Climate Agreement? Um, so in the very short term, um, COVID um, generated a small decrease in emission, but in the long-term graphs, when I watch the graphs, it doesn't change the game. Um, what we know, you know, actually the, there's been new reports coming out of September, is that we're going to reach 1.5 degree uh, before 2030. It could be as early as 2025, uh, and we're going to reach 2 degrees by 2040 on current trends. Uh, we also know that once we reach 1.5 degrees, uh, so from later this decade, we can expect that the forest fires we have seen now in California, Oregon, etc., will become, you know, by the end of the decade, a, a large number bigger, maybe four or five times bigger. So instead of having two weeks under the cover in, in, in Vancouver, it will be a month or two months, right? So that's just an example. But around the world, we'll start to see cascade and uh, catastrophic effects. Uh, and so... Uh, what we know is we have to find a way to avoid the cascade effect, the acceleration, etc. We have to try to decrease emission by half by 2030. So there's absolute urgency to, uh, to come together. Uh, and um, China actually just announced, you know, it's just an announcement that they will, you know, they will peak by 2030, but they said they will aim at carbon neutrality by 2060 which I know is seen by people in the climate sphere of, of a, a bit as a game changer. Uh, on the US side, of course, there has been no, uh, no declaration at the moment. If anything, there are negative actions. Uh, but however, there are many US states and companies that are doing great. Uh, so the US is a mixed picture in, in the outcome. Um, what we can learn um, is essentially the crisis by 2030 or so on climate will be way greater than what we can imagine. And so if we feel chaos from COVID, what we should learn from this, there is urgency to come together and we can only do it as the whole planet. If anything, this shows that the whole planet has to work on this. Uh, and otherwise we'll be in very, very difficult straits, uh, you know, in, in the very near future, we're talking 2030s, right? Great, yeah, great response. So kind of moving, shifting gears to kind of another area of presentation of this next question is from your colleague, your UBC colleague, Heidi Torek. So she's asking, do you think COVID has altered any dynamics of immigration as there seems to be a major change, at least in the short term? Hello, Heidi. Uh, so you probably know more than me on this. Um, well, what, uh, what we can see, of course, is there is much less movement of people at the moment, right? So in the mo uh, at the moment, uh, legal immigration is mostly frozen. 
uh, because there's so little uh, traffic. However, in Europe, we still have ships uh, crossing the, 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 the sea. It's not quite the level of uh, the previous crisis, 2014, 2015, right? The number is uh, three times smaller. However, we do see uh, ships crossing. Uh, what we do see is because COVID has generated so much economic social tensions in Europe, uh, the, um, the willingness of European countries to see those refugees coming is even less than before, uh, including Germany, right? Uh, and so we, what we can see, the political effect is great, great tensions. Um, and of course, there is a humanitarian crisis on one hand, you know, people you know, in crowded boats escaping conflict or escaping uh, poverty, uh, and they're facing a Europe that's not ready and that's less and less willing. And so in the European setting here, we see great tensions. Uh, and it's very, very difficult because it has an effect on, uh, on uh, democracy, right? And many governments on duress. Um, and, um, you know, in some countries, it keeps feeding uh, the rights of potential populist options, uh, even though the populist parties don't have credible platforms when it comes to economic management or global globalization or global governance management. Uh, so there is, uh, there is that tension, but we know climate change will be the biggest driver uh, going forward, right? There's all kind of models for the UN from the WEF showing that uh, particularly desertification in a part of Africa will send not just hundreds of thousands, but millions, uh, you know, when it comes 10, 20 years later. Uh, so again, we're back to climate change. Climate change will move so many millions of people uh, if unchecked. Great, so moving to our next question is from Claire. So Claire is asking, what would your views on Canada's role and strategy in the Indo-Pacific region in light of COVID-19? And they're also asking if there are potential areas for transatlantic or rather trans-Pacific cooperation in the region in light of kind of this COVID-19 uh, situation. Um, I mean, if anything, as I mentioned, uh, COVID-19 has increased the gravity, the, the, gra the pool of gravity of Asia as a whole, right? The whole of Asia has also set a, a, a scene for more uh, intense security tension, uh, confrontation right, between the US and China. And with all the, the, the different front lines from India to South China Sea to the Taiwan Strait to uh, Hong Kong, et cetera. Uh, so those are two factors. Uh, the best strategy we have so far, I mean, as far as I can see, is the Japanese version of the free, open, free and open Indo-Pacific, because it's kind of very sophisticated. On one hand, uh, it includes uh, a very realist arm of a sort of an alliance strengthening to protect oneself and be ready uh, for security tensions um, and also reaffirming rule of law, et cetera, and institutional setup, basically trying to reaffirm institutions. On the other hand, it does have an economic engagement platform which remains open to China. So it's a mixture of stick and, and carrots. Uh, and we know that, uh, for example, um, on the Belt and Road Initiative, so all the investments uh, in uh, all kinds of countries in Asia that China is leading, if China and Japan cooperate, given the incredible high quality of Japanese uh, infrastructure uh, experience, uh, that would ensure actually higher quality. Uh, and so that's a potential outcome that, that Japan has put on the table. But to also remember in Southeast Asia, the Japanese have a higher cumulative investment total than the Chinese so far. So uh, Japan has a huge role to play. And I think uh, for Canada, which is a smaller player in Asia, working with the core partner uh, and the core ally has a lot of sense. We should also work with Korea, another key uh, player, and Singapore. So those are uh, three very smart, very, very important, very strategically informed players in this region, which is complex, right? It's both more important and more risky than before. Great, so our next question is from Liam Lau. So he's asking, um, quick question on international political economy. Do you see some sort of post-COVID economic crash coming up, uh, similar to that of the global financial crisis in 2008, if not worse? I'm assuming he's alluding to if we could actually have an even bigger crash than I think what we might already be in right now. So maybe your thoughts on that. Well, so yeah, we did have the Q2, the second quarter uh, crash, right? 
And uh, as many people have said, the IMF has sta I stated, this is the first time in human history that a third of the global economy was made idle. O overnight, right? within a week. Uh, however, at the same time, there has been the biggest unleashing of fiscal stimulus response uh, and monetary backup, the buying up all those bonds. So all those things happen within March, right? This is a kind of incredible. Uh, so in that sense, we did not uh, experience the same collapse as in 2008. Uh, the response has been as fast as the shock because the shock was so visible and so obvious. Um, so now we're in the rebounds period. We start to see a lot of trade uh, coming back, you know, globally, et cetera. Um, the question will be more uh, how uh, the unraveling of the fiscal stimulus and the monetary stimulus takes place, right? Because we have seen, uh, you know, 25% increase in debt for advanced countries uh, and incredible level of fiscal deficits. You're going to have to ramp it down, right, after 2021. That's the moment where we can see uh, great risks, right? Also, um, there is fragility on the stock market, which is still uh, very, very high and has been pushed by the fiscal and monetary stimulus. Um, and so it's, you know, it's hanging up there and there is potential correction. Um, and then finally, yeah, the debt can trigger some, uh, some tensions, some potential bank collapses. But I'm mostly worried about the, the consolidation of debt. Uh, so there's a very different crisis in that sense from uh, 2008, 2009. Great. Very, very interesting thing to note. Um, I guess having another economic crash on top of everything that we're going through right now, I guess, would just be the, the cherry on top of 2020. So fingers crossed. Um, so our next question is from Benjamin Strotha. So he's asking, Steve Bannon has claimed that the future of global politics is populist. Do you think that current trends indicate that populism will be a growing thorn in the side of the global order? Or do you think that it has already reached its high watermark as a global force? It's mixed. That is, in some countries, it's receding. Uh, you know, because the populist elected leaders, primarily Trump and Bolsonaro, have been the worst at managing COVID. And so, you know, there is a reality check at some point, right? If you don't perform uh, and, uh, you know, and the whole world is watching, uh, that cools down the, the uh, uh, cools down the appetite, right? We have to remember that populism rises as a movement of anger in response to establishment that is not performing, of course, and also when they're a trigger. So usually there's a mixture of anxiety, and then there's a potential target uh, that's identified by uh, you know uh, populist leaders. Um, however. Um, if once those in power don't perform, then uh, the support goes down and it has an effect sideways. Uh, but there are some countries where there is, uh, there's not been populist in power and the government has not performed very well. And so in those countries, there is risk. And for example, even France is one of those, right? Uh, the extreme right is uh, potentially doing better now than three years ago uh, because there's stronger position to, uh, to President Macron. Uh, and the numbers are not good on COVID or the economy in France. Um, so uh, it's a mixed picture. But uh, the, the problem, uh, populism comes to power on the back of anger. But if it doesn't have a full program of governance across a whole bunch of domain, uh, that is, if it doesn't integrate a lot of competence, then you won't be able to deliver. Uh, and so it would fizzle pretty quickly. And that's, that's the story of the 1930s. Um, you know, for many, well, except then we got Hitler, which uh, found his escape route uh, through a disaster. But <laughs> mm -hmm. very, very interesting. So I guess moving to our next question is from Keith Maxwell. So Keith is asking, could like-minded Pacific democracies, for example, Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada, form a regional forum for strategic, defensive, and economic cooperation? And I'm assuming he's asking this question in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic that we're all currently facing worldwide. Uh, they clearly have a lot to share, right? Uh, and it's not just them, right? There is, uh, there's more, there's more countries in the region that we can, uh, you know, for some discussions, include Indonesia, include the uh, Philippines, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so there is ground for a lot of discussion because all of them face similar problems. The global problems, there is the 
rise and the more belligerent China. There is a very difficult United States right now. So when you share a lot of problems, there's a lot to talk about. And uh, I know they are talking. Oh, there's a lot. There's more discussion laterally among those countries that were cited and others than ever before. Uh, but whether it gets to the level of an alliance that can do something, um, that's, that's the next thing. In order to have critical mass, it may need uh, to be even bigger than that. But those ones can start a conversation, see what, what they can achieve together, and then try to invite more. But clearly, if, um, if the U.S. doesn't come back in a leadership position, and it may come back, right? If Biden is elected, the U.S. is back. Uh, they, they clearly signal that they want to be back in leadership. Uh, and clearly they will be, you know, welcome in the end, right? Uh, so that will change that game. But if it's not the case, uh, then yes, uh, there is room for, for such a grouping and then see where you can go and, and bring more people. But eventually you would need to include more, more players. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I guess ki kind of in, in, that, in that vein, so Elena has a question about um, the Belt and Road Initiative. So she's asking um, if there are any immediate implications of COVID-19 on China's Belt and Road Initiative. Hi, Elena. Great question. Um, yes, so there are, there are some immediate consequences, which, which are a lot of projects are frozen right now or are going very, very slow. Uh, because people are not moving, you know, because uh, they have been actually a, a communication channel for COVID. Uh, some COVID was transmitted to Central Asia, to Iran, etc., through through those projects, and even in Africa. Uh, and so today, of course, movement of people is restrained, uh, and also all economies are facing enormous stress, uh, and they're all receiving uh, support from either IMF or from uh, World Bank or ADB, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so the financial picture of all those countries has been massively degraded. Uh, and so China will have to slow down projects, probably do debt refinancing. Uh, many, many recipient countries are in a debt situation that's difficult. Uh, and so it's a bit of a giant cooler on the Belt and Road, but it's not a total game changer because for a lot of countries, say Central Asia, they have enormous infrastructure needs and they have nowhere else to go. No one else is coming up with the money to build either road or trains or whatever. So, uh, you know, many of them still want uh, to go forward with infrastructure. They have only this option, uh, but they, uh, you know, currently need to pause, slow down, et cetera, and, and uh, review everything. Great. So our next question is from Bowen Wong. So kind of backtracking to, um, uh, I guess our earlier questions about environment and the climate crisis. So he's asking, you mentioned in the beginning that COVID is a trial run for how the world will deal with the climate crisis, an issue that requires global action. Yet, from your presentation, COVID has a lack of global cooperation and further exposed the, risk, the rifts of global institutions, for example, the World Health Organization, et cetera. Doesn't this guarantee the world will fail in tackling the climate change crisis? Great question, Bowen. Uh, yeah, that's very sharp. Uh, but the hope is that uh, we're going to learn from this failure. Uh, because clearly, uh, you know, not as many people would have died, the economy would not have been as badly damaged, and the geopolitics would not be on the brink of war as it is now, if there had been cooperation from the start. Uh, if there had been, uh, you know, some G20 meetings and UN Security Council meeting and agreement of protocol and uh, agreement on, on sharing, et cetera, everything. Uh, descending in tit for tat power play is the recipe for disaster. And it's nothing new, right? The world has done this all the time. You know, 19th century was full of those power play, power is might and power struggle. And that's why, you know, since uh, Woodrow Wilson and, and the Roosevelt moment and all this, we have made a huge effort to build institutions, to build norms, to build rule of law, et cetera. So my hope is, you know, all citizens kind of rise and say, look, you know, this was a failure. We, ha we have to do better when it's even bigger. Climate change will be even bigger because uh, it's going to destroy countries like nothing can. Uh, it's it's going to be, um, you know, completely uh, gut-wrenching. And there has to be massive institutional readiness in terms of money, in terms of welcoming flow of people, etc. And we're talking 2030s, right? 
Um, and so, and of course, we need to prevent this in the first place and cooperate. So I, I hope that everyone will recoil in horror and, and look at what's happening now and say, we got to do better, right? Humanity has the knowledge. Humanity has the science. We have the wisdom. We have the philosophy to do better than that. Uh, and instead, we are just bickering like, you know, like all the time through human history. We're not rising to our potential. And this is disappointing, right? Uh, but above all, it's a question of survival. Uh, the planet won't be great if we do this with climate. Uh, and, and we know it. Uh, a great book by Jared Diamond. Uh, he, he wrote several, actually. One is collapse. The other one is upheaval. But essentially, the theme is the same. Uh, shocks like this hit us, you know, like pandemics or climate. They hit the global society, civilization. And when civilization can get organized, can have enough trust, can uh, have institutional innovation, they're gonna get over this and they're gonna survive. But those who don't, uh, we don't organize and they have high unequal impact and they fight for their own narrow interest, then often you see civil civilizational collapse. That's what Jared Diamond has shown in his various books. So um, yeah, we are, we are under threat and we need to uh, find ways to cooperate. Yes, so I guess kind of as a second part or almost a follow up to that initial question, Bowen is also asking mm. if we as Canadians, as a middle power, if there's anything that we can do, despite lacking kind of leverage on that global scale. Um, Canadian government. Yes. Uh, so f first of all, Canada is, uh, you know, is an important example to a large extent, right? So having Canada hold together as a healthy democracy with good communication and good uh, you know, trust in handling crisis like this, that's already very, very important because uh, the normal example of the world, the US is not doing it right now. Uh, and so first of all, we have to really manage this right. Uh, and in that sense, it's critical to show how a democracy can mobilize knowledge. We have amazing science in Canada, amazing research, mobilize that knowledge be organized and then have healthy communication that respects the, you know, the rights of everybody, the freedom of everybody and pull together. So that's the number one thing, right? Canada really has to pull together, you know, so far it's okay, but could have been even better. Um, and then the next is Canada now is active in all the minilateral uh, coalitions, uh, but the choice will be uh, you know, after January. If we have a Trump too, then we can have to upgrade this. and. Uh, it's going to be crucial for Canada to work with all the big players and you know, all the major players uh, to go one level up and essentially uh, save all global <laughs> institutions and, and elements of cooperation to avoid a free fall. Uh, I know that there are conversations already about those things, but uh, today no one wants to believe yet that we're in that world, right? Uh, if we have a Biden administration which believe in global coordination, then it's different. Uh, you know, of course, Canada will then play in its own uh, traditional game, which is find uh, the areas where Canada has great comparative advantage and complement what others are doing. Uh, but so those are very two different situations after January. Yes, and I believe we will be finding out the results of the American presidential election, I suppose, in just over four weeks. Um, I guess we'll find out, I guess, once all the mail-in ballots come in and all those swing states are called. But um, uh, I'm sure most of us here will be glued to our TVs on the night of November 3rd. It will take, it will take uh, until December 14th. Oh, yes. So it's, it'll be a, we'll, we'll run it for the long haul. So kind of yeah. on the topic of the United States election. So Benjamin Strotha has a question. So should Biden win the United States election and the U.S. tries to rejoin the international order, do you think that it will be welcomed back as king of the hill, so to speak? Or do you believe that other powers will take that as an opportunity to renegotiate a global order with a less top heavy, I guess, top down power structure? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, of course, there are frustrations from the, the current four years, right? I have not seen one place where there has not been massive frustration. Uh, even the, the closest allies uh, uh, basically have gone through a very, very, uh, difficult four years, right? You know, and um, however, uh, there's also realism uh, everywhere among the allies and, and others. Um, that is, we cannot make it too hard for the U.S. to join back because we so desperately need the U.S. Uh, that, you know, maybe there will be a few adjustments here and there, but 
uh, you know, people will still be desperate to have the U.S. on board uh, because with the U.S., you know, many, many things become possible. Um, so I, by and large, I think the common interest will, <laughs> will dominate. Uh, however, there remains one issue, which is, uh, you know, to, as I said, 20 to 25 percent of global GDP have changed hands and even more is changing now. So the global institutions still require adjustments uh, to all the players that have, that have increased their voice, right? Because the world of 1945 was still a colonial world uh, and many countries were still a block. So Africa is under, uh, underrepresented, uh, India is underrepresented, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so uh, there will still be demands from all those newly risen areas to have more voice in the system. So that remains an issue, right? How do you adjust that? Um, so from there, but from the allies of the U.S., I think, despite the frustrations, there will be relief and, and, uh, and great desire to work together. <laughs> great. And I guess both of us calling in from, I suppose, the United States' greatest ally, Canada, I'm sure um, our government will be very closely watching that as well. So our next question is from Daniela Ramirez. So she's asking, kind of going back to, I think you're, you're mentioning about the realignment of a lot of um, global GDP and spending. So she's asking, debt and government spending has superseded levels of the 2008 financial crisis. How do you expect this to impact progress on development such as the SDGs? And how can middle nations step up to the plate to collaborate and provide aid for nations in the global south? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, there has never been uh, an opening of money of this sort, this fast, that much money has never been seen before. Uh, so Christina Figueres, for example, the architect of the Paris Agreement, where I, I you know, just published a book, but she has been making a point loud and clear that many others have, which is you are finally able to spend money at this moment, right? Because the, the crisis is such that there is no risk of inflation, so central banks can buy all the debt and it doesn't generate inflation at this moment. Uh, and so... Uh, this is the critical moment to make sure that this money is helping the SDGs and is helping the climate transition. Uh, if not, there will be historians later saying, what a great missed opportunity. This was the one shot in, uh, in 50 or 100 years. Uh, and so the way this money is spent is critical. Uh, uh, you know, they, essentially, there should be three principles. Uh, the first is it should be super well managed. You don't want to find any mismanagement later because that will be toxic politically uh, in any country, right? Uh, but second, you want, it has to be uh, you know, financially profitable projects to a large extent, all the projects where investment are done. But then third, this is the moment to shift the structure. Um, ODA is a hard one because uh, there are few countries where public opinion supports increasing ODA right now because people are so inward. Uh, and yet, uh, this is a critical moment when it comes at least to vaccine support, medical support, uh, and then green transition where uh, it should be in the interest of all countries, including developed countries, to support the developing countries that are engaged in those transitions. Uh, I, I hope that uh, there will be an increase, but it's hard because public opinion right now everywhere is suffering and it's more inward looking. Great. Yes. Yeah, so I guess one question that I would have personally then for you, Professor Jabervian, is I think is, is this COVID-19 pandemic, is it comparable to anything that kind of the global, the global community or kind of the, our geopolitical system has ever experienced kind of in the history since it's in, in its history since kind of being established, um, I guess about a century ago and, and since then, has there ever been anything that would be nearly as comparable to what we're going through right now in the year 2020? No, it's different. Uh, it has features that are different. Uh, so we know it's the greatest pandemic, uh, you know, rapid, rapid fire pandemic since 1919, since the Spanish flu. Um, I mean, yes, AIDS has killed more people uh, over time. It's been slow and, um, and uh, you know, of a different nature. Um, and uh, so that's that. But then COVID, the 1919 uh, Spanish flu did not generate this response. In fact, it was not fully understood. People were at war. And so nothing stopped and many people died, but the economy was not affected. The, the, the end of World War I dominated. So we don't have the combo 
pandemic slash economic shock. Uh, also, we were, you know, the, the World War I and dominated everything. Um, what we could compare it to the 1930s uh, economic shock uh, to some extent because it's happening at a time of power transition. So we have pandemic, we have global economic shock, we have power transition, we have geopolitical tensions. Um, but at the same time, we have a strong Keynesian response. Unlike the 1930s, this time, you know, they, you know there's massive spending and massive uh, monetary uh, you know, support, and therefore the pain is not as acute. Uh, there is a massive response. Uh, however, it's a moment of great chaos. So in that sense, we have to compare at moments of chaos and uncertainty and fluidity at the time of geopolitical transition and uh, institution under stress. So that's the kind of general theme. So in that sense, is that's the pandemic that dominates this the economy slash institutional slash economy crisis that's sort of the uh, you know geopolitical crisis that dominates what we see. Uh, so it's a high risk moment, and um, it we hope that humanity can learn. Right, we have a lot of cases to learn from uh, to devise a path out of this. Yes, and lucky us for all of us be living through 2020. I think um, we definitely will be we will be in the history books and our response. So I think maybe maybe recordings like this will be used by future historians on on kind of on what our academics of today were thinking about during during the year 2020. So I guess kind of backtracking a bit um, to a question that was asked a bit earlier uh, about the World Health Organization. So it mentioned that you've noted criticism of the World Health Organization as having been slow to declare a pandemic which we have heard repeated from many sources, including President Trump. Yet the World Health Organization did move fairly quickly to declare a public health emergency of international concern all the way back in January. So given the World Health Organization's institutional dependence on national government's data, could they have done better? Or would there be like a different calling for let's say a new or independent data collection capacity for the World Health Organization moving forward in the post COVID world? Yeah, so that's a fascinating question, but it's actually not new. We know, I mean, to answer this question, pretty much everything is in the book from uh, Osterholm and Olshaker from 2017, which depicted all the strengths and weaknesses of WHO. So you can do a balance sheet. On the strength side, it's an organization that brings everybody together, well, except Taiwan, but that's, uh, that's going to be fixed, I'm pretty sure, in the, in the, in the long term. Um, uh, but it brings everybody together and there's a lot of sharing of data. There has been great success with, uh, you know, uh, some uh, uh, vaccination campaigns, eradication of smallpox, so, etc. So for slow moving systematic campaign and sharing of data, this has been great. And it's the only one we have. Uh, the problem is the rapid reaction capacity. So with pandemic, whether they are flu type or they're COVID, and there will be more coronaviruses and more flu, right? The problem is we are in a globalized world. And so the way they write it, uh, you know, Olshaker and, and Osterholm, is today all you need is a tropical uh, issue. So, you know, usually will be in tropical areas, uh, a bat transmits to a, an animal and a human. And as long as this little outbreak is close to an international airport, which are everywhere now, this would be all over the planet very quickly. So we are in, in a different condition than we used to be. And so what we are lacking, we should complement the WHO with a rapid reaction capacity. And when it comes to rapid reaction, there are two problems WHO. First of all, it relies indeed on government for access, right? So in this case, it was in China. If China doesn't give access in early January, then there is no access and no data. Uh, and so that's been the problem number one. And problem number two, they have large committees, you know, for many countries and a lot of scientists, and they want a lot of data before announcing. They don't want to create panic or, so they, they function like a peer review mechanism and they only announce things that are definitely safe. The problem is by that point, the pandemic is, I know, is left out of the bag, right? So we know what we need. We know, for example, that on January 13, an incredible fact, right? On January 13, uh, there was a mission of doctors from Taiwan that went to Wuhan because they had university to university cooperation and medical medical cooperation. On January 13, they learned in a briefing that there was human transmission of that COVID. What did they do? They came back to Taiwan. They launched the Taiwan emergency plan immediately, the next day. 
and you know, Taiwan had its centralized CDC and launched everything the next morning. Uh, and immediately uh, produced more PPE, but they had massive stocks, uh, produced testing, and everything was <laughs> launched. The problem is why the rest of the world couldn't do that, right? Uh, on January 13, there should have been a global announcement uh, the same way that there was human-to-human -human transmission and the whole world should have gone on emergency. So we lack that reactivity. Now, I can also say that most scientists watching this, and there are epidemiologists at Harvard and all this, uh, by January 13, 14, 15, they kind of knew it. Uh, and by January 20, when uh, when China announced the complete lockdown of Wuhan, even I could guess that, right? You could see if China is locking down, you know, within a few days, it was 50 million people. You know that this is totally massive out of control. So on January 20, the world, even though the WHO still didn't say what it should have said, the world should have acted immediately. Uh, in any case, that's the failure of rapid reaction. We need almost a commando kind of a rapid reaction force. You know, a few super smart scientists that can tease the facts. And uh, we, we have to find a solution, yeah, going forward, because there will be more pandemics and they will not always be in China. Some will happen in the Midwest, in the US. Some will happen right? in tropical countries, typically. Mm -hmm. Great. So I guess kind of ending on our, on our last question, knowing that um, our time is just running out. So Keith Maxwell will end with the final question. And he's asking kind of, I guess, jumping off of your point about Taiwan having that very, very quick reaction when, although when those university scientists or those university academics went to Wuhan, he's asking, could we be more reactive with a smaller number of cooperating countries to facilitate health intelligence, early warning and notification? And I'm assuming that's kind of like the opposite of of let's say having China or the United States or having these big great powers um, kind of leading the charge for that? Uh, yes, a anything would help, right? So it's time to be uh, creative and innovative. Clearly we had a slow reaction. Uh, no, now the one thing we can say is when you have a new virus, it, it, it does take time to identify. And we have to be uh, put the record straight. We have to recognize one thing, which is that if I remember, it's January 5, uh, some scientists in Shanghai shared the entire genome of that virus. Uh, and that was unprecedented. So unlike SARS, right? That's why Taiwan could do the test kits immediately afterwards. Uh, so we had that progress, but uh, the failure happened when it came to, tr to identifying human-to-human -human transmission. Uh, and it can take a few days, but yes, we need to develop some kind of rapid identification method um, and it has to be able to spread very quickly, faster than what WHO can do right now. Uh, humanity will need this given the speed of travel, the speed of integration. Uh, I mean, the other thing we need to do is track all the reservoirs of, uh, you know, coronaviruses. Coronaviruses, they're easy, they're all in bats. And you track all the caves uh, and you leave them alone, right? Nobody should touch those caves. And then we should track uh, any animals that eat them. I mean, we can also do intense tracking on the ground. And I can tell you it's not happening because today we separate animal health from human health. We separate biodiversity protection from human health. Uh, and this is a mistake. We also know we should not be selling uh, pangolins and snakes that eat bats in markets, right? Uh, so that currently they shut down in China, but that has been a problem as well, right? Uh, and it won't be just China, so we have to be careful. Uh, this, is, this is a global issue, and we need the global capacity to track all those bats. Then we need to track all the, the industrial farms that have chickens and pigs next to each other. Uh, and it has to be a rapid reaction uh, capacity if anything happens. Great, yeah, so great way to end. I think that pretty much wraps up everything um, for for our questions. Unfortunately, of course, as always, we aren't able to get to everyone's questions, but um, I'm sure uh, reaching out or I'm sure maybe read Professor Chaburgian's upcoming book manuscript. Who knows how that'll turn out after we find out the results of the American election. So um, thank you so much. Those were some very difficult questions and it, I think it just goes to show how insightful our audience for this event has been. So um, kind of ending, in ending this event, Professor Chaburgian, did you have any sort of parting words or parting points that you wanted to leave with the audience? Um, on the geopolitics of COVID-19? Well, first of all, I want to 
uh, wish everyone to, to be well. I mean, this is, this is also a challenging time individually for everybody. I can, I can see among all the students we have at UBC, this is very stressful time because we, we're isolated, we're bombarded with risks and unknown factors all the time. Uh, you know, we have the health to deal with, the economic unknowns, and then the geopolitics and all kinds of things happening at the same time. So it's very, very important to uh, recognize that this is a very unusual time. And so first of all, yeah, take care of yourselves and take break and watch for any sign of frustration. It's normal. Uh, I really want to reinforce that. Uh, I see it everywhere around, around me. Um, and then in terms of geopolitics, uh, so this is both an interesting and challenging time. This is a moment where things are moving very fast. Uh, there are multiple narratives at the same time. So what I encourage is to, uh, you know, to be open uh, to studying all sources, uh, looking at all points of view. Uh, and then you know, what, what really motivates me in my own work is to, uh, you know, to help find institutional improvements and find ways to diffuse uh, you know, misperception, misunderstanding, et cetera, to, to find a way for humanity to, uh, uh, to do better, right? essentially to avoid potential collapse and, and then to, uh, to help uh, human prosperity and peace and justice. <laughs> yeah, so very uplifting words. I mean, right now, I think as a student myself, of course, it seems like the world's kind of collapsing. I'll be graduating in the upcoming in the upcoming years so china just looking at the job market or all those opportunities out there i think the worst part about unprecedented times is that you really can't plan for more than a few months ahead because who knows oh the state of the world will be and i think those thoughts are definitely shared with uh, most of my peers so i think kind of in ending this i'd like to thank you very much professor tubergian for lending your time your energy and your vast expertise um, to our cic vancouver audience and i'd also like to thank all of the many, many attendees who are, who are attending tonight and watching our socially distanced events. Uh, for now, uh, most of our events will be done virtually over Zoom um, to make sure that we are keeping to um, health guidelines, but, eventually, but hopefully down the road, once, if once the worst of the COVID-19 um, pandemic is over, then hopefully we'll slowly start to see a, a return to safe, socially distanced in-person events. Uh, so I think that's also very much, I guess, COVID-19 ties very, very much into the current um, situation in the Canadian International Council and, and how we run things here. So um, this will be actually our last sort of virtual event or last sort of event that we're going to be having before our upcoming annual branch meeting, which will be happening on October 16th at 5 p.m., which is a Friday. So that's kind of, that's kind of um, our sort of annual event where we kind of regroup and kind of discuss kind of what our plans are for the upcoming year. Of course, last fall, the last time we kind of had our annual branch meeting, I'm sure nobody could have really predicted um, everything that kind of happened in the last 12 months, of course. So, so there's definitely going to be a lot of, I guess a lot more looking at all of these global governance things, all these things that have been happening in geopolitics, all of these conflicts, crises, I'm sure many of which Professor Tuburgian was able to mention in his presentation, those will all very much be in our upcoming sort of upcoming roster of events once we um once we start um, planning for that and everything like that so again thank you so much professor chibergian for um coming in again thank you so much to our audience i think this is actually in fact the largest sort of virtual audience that i've seen so far in my time at cac vancouver so that's fantastic um if you're more if you're interested in kind of staying in touch with the canadian international council uh especially the vancouver branch which is our branch of my branch right now um, feel free to please reach out to us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I believe we have Snapchat as well now, uh, LinkedIn as well. You can email Vancouver at the CIC.org. That is Vancouver at the CIC.org. Um, we're always looking for new people interested in getting involved, new people wanting to volunteer or lend their expertise. Or if you think that you, that you want to be giving some of your expertise to a future potential CIC event, and we'll be more than happy to hear you out. So again, thank you everyone so much for coming and we very much appreciate it. And we hope everyone has a good rest of the evening. Stay safe and stay healthy. Bye. Thank you so much, Emmett. Thank you. <laughs>